Well, I'll start off with some brutal remarks. Vladimir Putin is using energy as a weapon to advance his war aims in Ukraine. And those in Europe and the United States who thought that an energy security threat from Russia had nothing to do with them discover their error. Putin is cutting off gas to countries just, you know, all the time. Europe and the United States would like to concentrate on a transition to green energy. But now they have to deal with spiking energy prices as a result of Putin's war, plus exacerbated by Putin's cutoff of gas to European countries. The European Union has pushed back by cutting its imports of Russian oil. Meanwhile, the Republic of Poland, that years ago saw the threat from Russian energy aggression more clearly than many others, has actually succeeded in taking itself out of the danger zone. And so when the Russians cut off the gas to Poland, the Poles were ready. Minister Piotr Naimski has been working till toiling in those fields for many years. It's a great panel. And the time, <laughs> the time is not the best for dealing with Putin's war of aggression and the energy implications. But it, in policy making, it doesn't matter what you want. It matters what you've got before you. And so on that cheerful note, um, Emily Meredith will be running the panel as the moderator, and I wish her the very best of luck. Europe, the United States, and the Republic of Poland represented. So thanks for the opportunity, and thank you all for being here. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Ambassador Freed. I'm Emily Meredith, I'm the Deputy Bureau Chief at um, Energy Intelligence's Washington office. And we have an excellent panel today uh, to talk through US-EU energy security at a time of both crisis and transition. So to my left, I have Piotr Naimski, Poland's government plenipotentiary for strategic energy infrastructure. On screen, we are supposed to have, hello, um, <laughs> Dieter Jul Jorgensen, the European Commission's Director General for Energy and Melanie Nakagawa, the Senior Director for Climate and Energy at the National Security Council. So I wanna set the stage a little bit here. In the four months since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we've seen the EU pledge to extricate itself from Russian fossil fuels by 2027. The EU has a new plan, Repower EU, to eliminate the 155 BCM of Russian gas it received last year. And the US is pledging to increase flows into Europe by 15 BCM this year and eventually reaching 50 BCM. Um, so I want to start with you, Dita, and then Melanie, um, essentially to get a status check on what progress has been made to these goals, given that you know winter is in a few months. I mean, we need to make some very short-term progress um, for Europe to be secure here, and then what's being made in the transatlantic relationship. Thank you very much, um, Emily, for, for the question, and thank you for inviting me here today. Sorry that I can't be there in person with Minister Naimski and, uh, uh, and Melanie Nakagawa. It's very good to see both of you uh, again. So uh, first of all, um, uh, maybe a more general point, which is in the challenges we're facing, and Ambassador Fried said it out very, very clearly in his introductory remarks, the challenges we're facing, the fact that Russia is clearly weaponizing energy, weaponizing uh, natural gas, means that international cooperation and transatlantic cooperation is more important than ever. And so I think uh, the close cooperation we have had uh, with, with the US over these last months, but also going into the, into the winter, uh, the presidential uh, engagement, the declarations, the joint statements are extremely important in terms of this uh, global unity, but also transatlantic unity, not just in terms of statement, but really in getting things done and delivering results. Um, secondly, speaking for the, EU, the EU side here, uh, we have, as you mentioned, um, Emily, this uh, repower plan, and I think it's quite important to be clear that it builds on three pillars, and we need each of these three pillars. 
The first pillar is, you said it, we consume 155 billion cubic meters of Russian gas a year. So we need to consume less in order to, uh, to, uh, to be able to, uh, to manage this, uh, this situation. We need to save energy, we need to reduce our demand with whatever technology is available for that. We need to be energy efficient. We've got a whole work program under the Green Deal, but it really is a crucial point in what we are trying to achieve here in reducing our dependence on Russia. We cannot replace all of this by other energy means, but we can reduce our consumption to help us get some part of the way. The second pillar is clean energy, alternative energy sources, uh, in particular renewable energy. So as much as possible, we should replace this by the acceleration of renewable um, el electricity generation in particular, but also by biomethane, biogas, uh, bioenergy more generally, uh, and the very quick uh, investment that can take place on photovoltaic, on rooftops. So a really important part of the repower is to replace it by other energy sources. Biomethane, biogas, I mentioned specifically because here you've got molecules that can go in directly and replace uh, the fossil gas molecules from Russia, so an important aspect in this one. And then the third pillar tends to be the one that gets most attention, and it is really important, but again, it only works if you, if you pursue these three paths or, or rest on the three pillars together. The third one is how do we replace Russian fossil fuel with fossil fuels from other suppliers, from other sources, and this is where our close cooperation um, and the and the the the, uh, the engagement from U.S. suppliers and from the and from the government to help make sure that we uh, that we that the LNG we need to replace uh, Russian gas is supplied to Europe. Um, so so that's an important um, aspect uh, as well. What we have seen so far, and this is then my my third point, and uh, and I um, just to give an update, you were asking, well, where are we in terms of achieving these goals, these targets we have set ourselves for 15 BCM this year? What we have seen since, the, since early in the year, from before the war, is a significant increase in the European uh, demand for LNG and in the global supply to the EU for LNG. So we are at a completely different place than, than where we were last year by, uh, by, by comparison. This is thanks to uh, the very good cooperation once again, and in particular the transatlantic cooperation, is also thanks to the investment taking, taking place in Europe over the last decade to establish the necessary infrastructure that allows us to rely on LNG. And third, it is thanks to the, um, the, the infrastructure investments and the diversification strategy that we have carried out in Europe. And as an ambassador Fried mentioned at the opening, Poland is a very, very good example of a very strong, determined policy to diversify, to stay uh, energy secure. We've done a lot across Europe, but again, Poland is a, is a good example. Thanks to Minister Naimski and his investment uh, into that. So, Melanie, I was hoping you could touch on um, where the U.S. is in trying to meet some of these. Sure, and I think it's a great place to pick up where my colleague Dita left off. One of the key areas to the US-EU cooperation around energy security that President Biden and President von der Leyen announced on March 25th really focused around two key pillars that lifted up where the European Commission stated their goals were. The two pillars, as Dita mentioned, uh, which really tie into Repower EU, was the first pillar was around diversifying gas supply into Europe um, at various quantities. So there's one about 15 BCM this year, and then with the goal of diversifying of the 155 plus BCM of Russian gas that Europe currently takes by you know, 2025, 2026, um, they want to reduce that or even you know, later. And so what can the US do to support part of that and be part of that diversification effort? So the president you know, striving to ensure that 50 BCM of that could be coming from US resources. And then the second key pillar is around reducing gas demand. And what makes that pillar quite exciting is under Repower EU, that has a potential savings of 170 BCM alone through the actions within Repower EU by reducing gas demand. So the US has worked uh, steadily, Dita and I, as well as our colleagues, to figure out what are the key steps we need to take to get towards those goals and objectives. On reducing, on the diversifying, as Dita mentioned, we're seeing, uh, I think, a tripling of US, current US exports of gas to Europe this the past six months than compared to last year. And this is really everything from um, redirecting flows to existing cargoes moving into Europe, um, again, ahead of this winter as they get into storage season. On the second part, this is an exciting area of work where it's really around engaging on smart technologies, things like smart thermostats, heat pumps, um, technologies that can surge into Europe, ideally ahead of this winter, but also what is the path to increasing manufacturing of these products to continue to ramp up 
the delivery of these technologies that really show a stickiness and ability to actually reduce gas demand in industrial facilities, in buildings and commercial facilities as well, as well as among, uh, around households as well. We have some great examples in the United States of how smart technologies can help us be more efficient. And so how do we help support Europe in those goals um, as they look at this winter as well as next winter in particular? Another key area um, on the gas component is really around the methane management. So another key area, while not specifically under the task force, last week President Biden convened the Major Economies Forum where we launched the Global Methane Pledge Energy Pathway. So many are familiar with the Global Methane Pledge to reduce global methane emissions, and the Energy Pathway was a continuing continuation of that and implementation of it to basically call on countries to pass measures and put in place regulations and policies to actually begin to implement measures that reduce methane. This, I think, is critical to what the task force is doing, because we can look at US volumes of natural gas with better measurement, verification, and monitoring around the methane intensity of that gas that's going to Europe with the goal of what the task force has a, a mandate to do, which is increasingly decarbonized gas into Europe to, so that it is aligned with their 5055 and their climate objectives. So we're excited to see um, that, pro that endeavor go forward. That is also a great example of US-EU cooperation, as that is the Global, Ener Global Methane Pledge Energy Pathway is a, a collaboration between the US and the European Commission as well. Um, so really tying those pieces together are just some snapshots of some of the progress in just the last few months alone. So, Piotr, Poland has, as everybody has mentioned, has been working on its plans to diversify away from Russian gas for years. So can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges you faced in doing that and if you've got any uh, lessons learned for the EU? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for nice words uh, uh, connected to our strategy, energy strategy during the last years. Uh, this is the truth, you know, Poland relatively well is prepared to this crisis or war, because we are in war. Uh, we can uh, survive without uh, Russian gas supplies. Uh, the long-term contract uh, with Gazprom uh, was supposed to expire by end of the year in December, but uh, they cut off the supplies uh, with the end of April. So we can, uh, we can secure supplies for our uh, purposes. Uh, we have uh, storages 100% uh, filled already. Uh, we have uh, infrastructure uh, ready to, uh, uh, to accept diversified uh, uh, in uh, sources and, uh, and routes uh, uh, supplies. Uh, uh, we are commis commissioning uh, every month this year investments which were started uh, uh, 2016. Uh, the last one will be Baltic Pipe, which is pipeline, gas pipeline connecting uh, the Norwegian shelf uh, under Baltic Sea with the Poland, and it will be October 1st. But the thing is that, uh, that you see, what, what we are witnessing, what we have to uh, deal with uh, today it's not just a regular crisis, energy crisis or market crisis or, 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 or whatever. We are in war. We are in war. It's not, le not only battlefields in Ukraine, but energy specifically is uh, weaponized by Russians, is used as the weapon against us, mean, mean, uh, means that against uh, uh, European countries again and and. It affects us globally, and uh, what uh, what is necessary? This is really my my view, my opinion, is to admit that we are in war. And if we admit that we are in war, the consequences are very uh, uh, clear. War is costly, so we have to be prepared to uh, pay for the war. And uh, war uh, needs uh, specific and uh, unusual management, war management. So it needs decisions. It needs decisions from the administration's levels, which sometimes could be uh, uh, against, let's say, market economy, because they 
come from responsibilities. You know, responsibility for energy security lies on the governments, not on international bodies, but on the governments. So this is for the governments to look for certain solidarity or collective approaches or approach to the, to the problem. Uh, you know, if we are discussing sanctions or counter-sanctions or possible caps uh, 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 for, for, for prices, you know, what does it mean? It means that we are discussing uh, solutions which are war solutions. And this is what we have to accept with all consequences. You're bringing <laughs> up a really interesting point about the degree to which this is a government, there are government policy solutions versus market solutions, and that markets can't always fill in when the objective is security, right? Um, you know, the US and EU are trying to balance both these near-term goals of getting off of Russian gas, ensuring that there's security of supply for the next couple of years as the transition takes hold, um, and also this medium-term goal of decarbonization. Uh, US LNG exporters, meanwhile, are saying that they need longer-term contracts in order to convince banks to give them the financing to expand um, US LNG exports. So for Melanie, you know, I guess first, do you think that um, U.S. LNG capacity needs to increase, and then also, is there a role for the U.S. government to play to kind of foster that? And then, um, for everyone, Dita included, are there government policies and tweaks that can help smooth out this process, especially for companies that are wary of taking a years-long bet on natural gas in an environment where the focus is eventually getting away from fossil fuels? Great, thank you. So on the LNG question, some of the ways that we're trying to support Europe in this endeavor to diversify has already been seen today, which is the U.S. approved uh, to non-FTA or the ability for U.S. exports to go to non-FTA countries, to Europe and other destinations, as we provide that flexibility. <laughs> and I think that's a really important signal to send. In terms of increased capacity, you know, we need to take a look at what's already under construction today. You know, U.S. LNG capacity is already planned for in the system to be expanded. The question becomes, where do those volumes go? And this is, the, this is where we were having these conversations with Europeans about um, how, is European, how is Europe the destination for some of these cargoes um, that, are, that are under construction and underway that have yet, been, yet to be contracted for? And that's really where the US-EU conversation is around, which is how do we involve US companies as Europe is seeking more supply and now in, in a way that we hadn't expected ever before this war. You know, Europe had a, a, had a supplier of this fuel and now they don't, and now they're trying to move to a new player. So this is a, it's just a different time, and as the, as the minister said, this is a wartime footing as well. And so we really are looking at different ways to move around these molecules, and how can we be a reliable player and a reliable supplier to Europe in that context. Um, another key piece to, to this topic that you raised really is around um, what else could we be doing on the decarbonization front. And as I mentioned, we really see a lot of opportunity here for the U.S. to play a key role around supporting a range of the Repower U package, whether it's renewable energy, as well as the work around uh, workforce development, energy efficiency upgrades, and a suite of those areas. Um, another key piece that I think you flagged was how do you balance these pieces, right, in terms of, um, and where do our sanctions play a role in that, in that conversation? Our sanctions have always have never been designed as a sole tool or a singular tool to uh, impose as much cost on the Russian economy as possible. It's really a set of tools coupled with our military assistance or humanitarian assistance, all ways to strengthen Ukraine while weakening Russia. And I think if you look at the Russian economy today, 15% inflation, uh, their economic growth, I think is expected to reduce in size by another double, by double, I think is what the current projections are. And if you think of the Russian economy as a, as a part of what they, how they exert strength, the weakening of it is a key indicator of the kind of impact our efforts are having um, in this wartime effort. And we're really looking at the full range of, of opportunities we have to continue down this effort of how do you continue to strengthen the Ukrainians while also weakening uh, Russia throughout this, uh, throughout this um, engagement. Um, for, hi, so for Dita, um, 
you know, in terms of when it comes to securing supplies, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the structure of this joint procurement plan that the European Commission is fostering in terms of buying um, LNG, and you know maybe just give us an update on how many states have signed up. Will the EU be able to agree to long-term contracts um, in this mechanism? If you're worried at all about competing with individual member states, which are doing their own procurement, perhaps that would be great. Thank you very much. And maybe, uh, first of all, I think some really interesting points um, have been made both by Minister Naimsky and by, and by Melanie, and I think we're very much aligned on, on this. Um, as the Minister Naimsky said, this is not just a crisis, there is a war in Ukraine. So in everything we do, including in our energy policy, we're looking at, well, how do we best support Ukraine? How do we find the, the best balance in our policies in order to do that? And energy policy is obviously central to to this conflict, the consequences we see in the rest of Europe, outside Ukraine, are, are seen very, very strongly in the field of energy policy. And so it does call for, for, for government uh, action, government intervention, and, and, and taking uh, responsibility. To give you one very concrete example, we have had a storage policy that has been market driven and that has worked quite well because you would typically have a price spread between summer and winter. And so our gas storage has been, has been filled. Uh, until um, this winter, uh, where there was a clear policy to ensure that flows would not go. Um, and so there were, we went into last winter with lower levels of storage, and we want to make sure that doesn't happen again. So we have put in place a, a, a strong European common framework on storage to make sure it, that there is a, a, an obligation to fill gas storage so we go into next winter in a prepared way. So just an example of the type of, of intervention, the type of measures that we, that we need to take given circumstances and, and how this also uh, supports Ukraine uh, in, uh, in the more, as much as we can with the different instruments uh, we have. Uh, this is obviously not the primary instrument, but it is, but it is relevant also in this, in this context. Um, you asked about the, the, the EU energy platform and joint purchasing, which is one of the different instruments we are setting up for ourselves as part of this Repower EU in terms of how do we best, um, how do we best help bring security of supply and how do we best once again implement these different pillars, the energy savings, energy efficiency, demand reduction, the shift to cleaner sources of energy, renewable energy, and then the replacing the molecules by molecules and elsewhere, the diversification and, and the alternative um, suppliers. Um, and so uh, I think it is quite important to see it in the context of these other government actions. So we're signing up, for example, to MOUs with supplier countries. We're working closely with different supplier countries to, to look at well, where, what are, what are, what are um, long-term credible supplies. We are making sure we send the right signals to the market because there have been some suggesting, well, aren't you stepping out of natural gas? Well, no, not yet. We see natural gas as a necessary energy component, energy carrier. Um, in the energy transition, so we are in this for the longer term and are ready to, uh, to, to sign up long-term contracts, as you may have seen in recent days that some European companies and member states um, have done. Melanie mentioned uh, methane, the, 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 the global methane uh, pledge and the pathway. So there's a lot, a lot going on there to align the green transition with Repower EU. They essentially point in the same direction, energy efficiency, uh, renewable and clean energy, and then making sure that the natural gas, the molecules we use are as clean as possible through the instruments there, uh, and that they replace coal uh, wherever that is, wherever that is, um, wherever that is possible. In, in terms of joint purchasing, what we are looking at is working closely, as I said, with suppliers. We are looking at aggregating demand at European level, so bringing together uh, member states, member states company for a discussion around how do we best do it and how do we best make more um, better use of the of the import uh, infrastructure, the import uh, capacity we have. So we have now a number of LNG terminals across Europe. You will see more LNG import terminals coming online, some even before winter, some during the coming six to 12 months. Um, and so how do we make best use of that uh, capacity? What we've seen in recent years is that um, about half, maybe 60% of the capacity has been used in a typical year. And that can, of course, go up very, very significantly. Again, that will help us move away from Russian gas. And so this EU energy platform, the joint purchasing, that is an instrument that addresses several different aspects of gas and gas contracts. And the objective is uh, the one, the risk you point to, how do we make sure that there's not some, uh, some internal European uh, competition for the molecules and for the contracts and, for, um, uh, and for, for getting out there in the market? How do we best cooperate on that for the best uh, outcome uh, um, across Europe? 
but it's clear that whatever we do at European level has to work together with and coexist and, and complement what member states do. We have a market here. We've got companies that are that are operating in this market. There's a lot of good things uh, happening there, a lot of expertise. And so we're not trying to replace that. We're trying to make the market function better, including in terms of um, better use of infrastructure and better use of, of what we have to offer in terms of predictability, long-term contracts, uh, a, a significant uh, market. And so I think there is uh, there is potential uh, there also for suppliers from across the world, and we see we see an interest. Piotr, is the joint platform something uh, Poland would consider? Dita, I, I, uh, I think you are very idealistic. Uh, what I what I would like to say is, to, that, is that the competition uh, in, among European companies, European states, is deeper and deeper. There is a competition for everything, for LNG carriers, for LNG it, itself, uh, for capacities uh, in LNG terminals or pipelines, uh, uh, for uh, crude oil uh, replacing uh, Russian supplies, etc., etc. So it w it will need really great effort, great effort to balance this uh, uh, competition growing up uh, in Europe with uh, uh, solidarity or 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 uh, uh, collective or uh, you know. Uh, common denomination interests uh, approach uh, among European states. This is ahead of us. You know, we have to discuss it. We have to, to meet, to, to have series of meetings uh, on a company's level. You know, uh, uh, companies will, shippers will, will sign these contracts, not the European Commission, frankly speaking. <laughs> um. I want to touch on sanctions briefly. So, you know, as I understand it, and we've, we've talked about it a bit already, but the motivation in getting off of Russian oil and gas is twofold. You know, one, reducing vulnerability, but two, also reducing the financial flows um, going to Moscow. So could each of you touch on, you know, how effective the sanctions and embargoes um, so far have been, and whether you're considering changes or new measures that could help get to this stated goal of reducing financial flows to Russia while also minimizing the economic pain at home. I mean, we've seen prices are quite high, which means that both, um, both goals are not quite being met here. I'm happy, do you wanna start, Melanie? Uh, I'll pick up where I, where I sure. last left yeah. off, which is, um, how we think about the full package of economic implications for the Russian economy, of which sanctions is um, a key component, but not the only component to it. So we want to measure the impact of our actions through what is actually happening across the Russian economy through the full suite of our, our, our actions. I also want to commend the European Union, who we've been you know, close allies, and as the minister mentioned, the solidarity between the US and the EU has been really critical to ensuring that we are a united front. And I think that might have caught many by surprise in terms of just how unified we have been in our response and our engagements and our actions um, through Russia's further invasion into Ukraine. And so with EU's most recent sanctions package, and again, we've been doing this in a, in a partnership way, um, this includes a phase ban on the import of Russian oil to the EU. And this action brings on more economic measures into further alignment with our actions and supports our commitment to reducing the reliance. So it goes to your first part of the question, which is how do you support the reduction of reliance in the European Union to the Russian, Russian energy? Um, the second part is around the cost and how are you ensuring that that cost is truly borne um, and doesn't actually have a perverse effect of padding Putin's pocket. And I think as you, as you know, I'm not previewing or breaking news here, but the, you know, the G7 is coming up and there are just conversations underway always around energy, climate security, food security, uh, humanitarian work. And I think this is an area where, again, as, the, as our countries come together to think through what are the range of tools we can, we can continue to put on the table that maximizes this cost, does not create this perverse incentive, and truly, as a measurement of um, looking at the Russian economy, how are we measuring our success 
in terms of delivering the impact. You know, we look at the inflation cost, we look at what the Russian central bank is saying in this space. And you're seeing, you know, as Russia, as, as Europe moves out with these uh, upcoming sanctions packages around oil and the energy sector, uh, really working closely with them to ensure that that does not lead to, uh, you know, a, a drastically rising cost um, that could only perversely undermine our efforts. And that's, what, that's why we have close coordination. I was going to say, what, what's the mechanism for that? I mean, Dita and Melanie, for this increased competition amongst Europeans and, and everyone else, right, for a, a shrinking pot of supplies in some ways. Um, We've heard some talk about a price cap. I mean, are there changes to the mechanisms that no, it's, need it's, to be? No, I mean, it's, it, it seems to be clear. No, it needs a, a rising production of mm. crude oil globally. You know, we have to replace this, uh, uh, what uh, we would like to stop flowing from, from, from Russia. And any sanction or sanctions, they need practicalities. You know, they, we, we don't... I mean, we, we, we shouldn't create, you know, global black market for crude oil, for example, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, but, but saying, having said that, uh, I think that the most strict sanctions against Russia today, the better future for us, for Ukraine, for Europe, for, uh, I mean, for all democrat, dem democracies, because you know we are entering really dangerous time. This is uh, a time which will be called probably in the future by some historians or politicians second Cold War or mm -hmm. something like similar. Tito, is this something you <coughs> want to speak to? <laughs> yes, thank you. I, I, I think um, I really agree with a lot of that's been said, including uh, Melanie's point about the very close uh, coordination, cooperation, close really unity, working together as we develop sanctions, making sure that the sanctions we've put in place, each at our side, but also with other global partners, that they are the most effective possible in terms of impacting Russia, while of course making sure that we're not harming ourselves um, uh, more than necessary, there is a cost, and that cost is something we are ready to bear, that should be absolutely clear, uh, but, but to make sure that there is a good balance there. Um, and I think in the six packages we have adopted so far within the European Union, I think we have, we have managed to find a, a good balance. Um, the, the six package uh, addressing oil, as Melanie said, will, will uh, eliminate um, about 90% of the flows of, uh, of crude oil from Russia to the European Union by the end of the year, so this is really very, very um, significant. Um, as you, um, as you uh, asked about in terms of the global markets and, and how do we need to ensure uh, supplies, um, uh, uh, Emily, um, as, uh, as Minister Naimsky said, well, we need to look at global supplies and need to work towards a better balance in global markets, and that's for both oil and gas. If you look at the latest reports from the International Energy Agency, you can see that we have been in a, in a, in a global context where demand has increased quite, for, for natural gas, sorry, has increased quite significantly as countries got out of the lockdown from, uh, from COVID. We're seeing some of the same things in oil, and in some cases, supply has not been able to quite follow, and that was what drove the first um, uh, natural gas price hike uh, in autumn that we have been impacted very significantly by uh, in Europe. And so we need to work towards a better balance on the supply demand side, and this is a global issue which is extremely important, obviously in the energy context, but also very much in the macroeconomic context. And, and as others have also mentioned, it links directly into food security and the global food crisis that is, that is, uh, that is out there, that is developing in front of our eyes for different, uh, also for reasons linked to the war and to, uh, to the Russian blockade against uh, grain exports. But I mean, there are a number of factors coming together where we, I think, as governments have a responsibility to, to act. Um, uh, Melanie has referred to G7 discussions in the coming days, and that is indeed an important forum and a, an important location uh, in, this, in this context. And then I think I've said demand reduction, energy efficiency, energy savings many times, but it really is a crucial point that we need to look at our demand and see, well, what, what can we do and we have uh, come out with a, with a, with a savings plan and um, together again with the International Energy Agency. And here what we see is we could save uh, around 13 billion cubic meters of our gas imports simply by, by saving some simple things of putting our thermostats down by one degree, driving, uh, in the case of oil, driving uh, 10 kilometers uh, less per hour than, uh, um, than, than what we do now. 
Um, so there's a lot that can be done by savings, energy efficiency, demand reduction to help move towards a better balance in global markets, and I think that's a, that's a critical point. I, if I may, yeah. I, I think that, that we should uh, uh, strictly divide our plans or tactics uh, uh, in terms of uh, timing because we have imminent threats and imminent dangers next winter yes. or in in Denmark for example you know there is an alarm because because possible uh, gas supply uh, constraints uh, uh, are on the way uh, and this is you know important today this will be important you know in the next half half a year and uh, we should uh, stress on uh, solving these imminent problems. And then we have medium-term uh, uh, targets or, or issues to be solved, like, for example, this uh, liquefying, uh, 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 LNG liquefying facilities in the United States or in Europe, you know, lacking still parts of uh, uh, infrastructure, trans gas transmission infrastructure. Uh, structure, uh, or, uh, or, or you know, some uh, or, or oil uh, globally, uh, uh, the balance on crude oil market because this is uh, really crucial. You know, we wouldn't like to have you know uh, hundred dollars per barrel, uh, right? Uh, so this will will need probably two three years. I mean, to, to achieve the goals. And then we have long-term strategic goals or, or, or goal, which is green transition, you know. We, we, this will take another 30 years. Already, we, already 30 years passed after we uh, finished Cold War and we are entering probably, probably another one. So this is long-term strategy. And I think on, you know, on that point, you know, one thing, as you, as, the, as you mentioned, was production, right? One of the questions was with you on production. And the other key point I thought was raised was around the temporal horizon, the immediacy, right, this next few weeks, few months. And I think it's a real uh, sort of great way to, to capture the Bi you know, President Biden's approach to this topic, which has been how do you surge volumes on the market today? So this is not natural gas, it's around crude oil, to picking up the minister's last point. But the reason why the president announced, you know, a million barrels a day of a release from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve um, as well as working with nations all around the world in you know, arguably the largest coordinated global releases of stocks to over 240 million barrels this year. Those are just exactly to that point about how do you provide immediate relief by signaling the type of crude oil volumes that'll be available in the market through the strategic releases to deal with the near-term issues. But in the same breath, the president then DPA'd um, critical minerals for batteries, for electric vehicles, because the idea was we think we, we, now we think we can do both. That while we are really, you know, putting crude oil on the market today in a near-term, short-term release through the reserve, we're also at the same time investing in the EV technology that we need on the road in the next year, two years, three years, and four years and beyond so that we can, to what Dita mentioned, reduce the demand. Because I think that's the other key part to this, that it is a supply and demand. And that also is reflected in our actions. That's not just about producing more. It's also transitioning to the technologies that help us use less, but still do everything we want to do. We can still drive where we need to go, you know, use the energy we need. It's just the source of that comes from a different um, supplier. It's a battery versus a, a gas station with, with, with gasoline. So that's been a real key piece, which is really to lean into not just production, but also the things that can help us reduce demand to really address the near-term crisis while also in parallel putting out our medium-term signals. In terms of the near-term crisis, Melanie and Dita, I wanted to touch briefly on the Freeport LNG outage. Um, this is the export facility that's slated, that's offline now and is slated to be offline for the rest of the year. Does this present a challenge in meeting European demand for this winter, Dita, um, and potentially in getting to this 15 BCM number, Melanie? Um, is that something either of you can speak to? I think Dita's going well, to I can maybe briefly, uh, um, uh, Emily, uh, obviously that, that, that is, is not good news and the timing is not good globally. Uh, having said that, as both I think Melanie and myself uh, mentioned earlier, we have seen a significant increase of LNG supply to Europe already this year. 
very, very significant levels. And so I must say on that basis and on the basis of what we see being out there, we are uh, not optimistic, but uh, because that one should not be blindly optimistic, but confident on the basis of, of an analysis of, uh, of that, that we will be able to, uh, to meet our targets jointly uh, with, the, with, the, with the, the US. If I may just briefly come back to what Minister Naimsky rightly said about this temporal scope, we need to focus on the immediate challenges to make sure we stay secure, and then we've got medium and longer term uh, challenges, and that's exactly what we Power EU does. We're looking at, well, how do we get into the winter secure with our storage build? Savings are immediate as well, so the 13 billion cubic meters I mentioned that we could cut off our consumption, that can be done immediately. So there are things uh, also on, on that side that can be done very, very quickly. And then also making sure that the medium to long-term investments we make uh, both are go in the right direction in terms of security of supply, but also that we don't make the wrong investments that will tie us into something that does not work in line with our longer-term uh, perspectives. So, um, uh, but I think this, this, uh, this focus on the winter, making sure we're ready, that's what we really have been working on uh, under the power EU and under our common uh, European preparedness and solidarity plans that are in place. Thank you. Thank you. So I think, unfortunately, we have run out the clock ourselves um, without taking audience questions. I believe your next stop is lunch. Um, so I will turn it over to our, to our hosts here. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, guys, for an excellent panel. I really appreciated it. Some great questions. Thank you. Thank you.